we're sitting in his office. He said, how am I going to get to the next level for this breakthrough? He said, it's easy. They originally had a goal of 80 million. I got him to commit to 100 million. They ended up doing 140 million. And he said, every day I did the 2A++. I didn't miss a single day. I got Ben Newman. What's up, man? Ryan, it's great to see you. Yeah. Great to finally get in studio with you. Yeah, man. It's funny. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon introduced us, and she's introduced me to a lot of people recently. She's amazing. She's amazing. And um, I didn't realize you had DM me before. And I was like, dang, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> but, you know, here we are. We're here. We are here. We're here. And he actually had my guy, Don Saladino, uh, yesterday. yesterday, which is wild. Yeah. Because I met him through Dr. Lyon, and she's like a great connector of people. It's just, she's a force. Yeah, she she's is. amazing. So for the people, you know, today, I mean, like, what what do you do today? So, I gave a brief history, but yeah. Yeah. So today I do performance coaching primarily on the mindset. Yeah. And so I stay in shape. So a lot of people think that, you know, I might be like a strength coach. I'm not a strength coach for these football teams. It's all on the mental side. And I found over doing this for over 18 years that the difference for the highest performers in sports and business is how they approach their discipline, how they approach their days, how they build their environment and how they attack from mental side. That is typically the difference. And even in the interactions as we've built a relationship, I can tell that's been the same for you from playing baseball to getting into business. You understand it's those little, little pieces on the mindset that you can find and identify and attack that make the difference. Yeah. Yeah. It all starts with your mind for how you, you act, but let's go back to corporate America. Cause there's a lot of people watching this who are working jobs and everything else. How did you rise up out of there? So ri rising up out of corporate America started with the daily disciplines to get recognized is probably the best way that you could say it. I had a passion and a discipline. I was a financial advisor. So I went to Michigan State University, paper broker actually in Chicago for three years. So I've always loved sales. I was running a branch of a mortgage company in college, hiring my girlfriend and friends and all this. And it, it was incredible. So I've always loved sales. Yeah. Then I was a paper broker, basically Steve Carell out of the office. What's a paper broker? So you're going to sell commercial print paper, like 22,000 pounds at a time, a mill in Canada is going to, mill in Canada is going to produce it. You're going to negotiate a trucking rate. You're going to go find a paper company, whether it be a newspaper. Okay. I mean, you're hustling. Is that still a job in today's world? It is still a job, but not nearly as good. As a job. <laughs> I was going to say, as, as it was, I was making great money out of college, yeah. but it was one of those things. Now, no, it, it is completely changed. I mean, you just look at newspapers are this big compared to, yeah, you know, yeah. the way, or completely non-existent on the iPad or on the iPad. Yeah. Then it was a financial advisor, and I say this very humbly, but got off to a fast start because of my personal story and conviction, losing my mom 11 days before my eighth birthday. Wow. So life insurance put me through college. So not that I would scare people with my story, but when you have that conviction and passion, you're going to attack that opportunity to write those stories again. So that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Every day I could sit down with Ryan and his family and help him make the same decisions that my mother made for me that put me through college. Yeah. And so I got off to a fast start and a... Firm in Chicago, I was a 26 year old kid. They said, we'll pay you 500 bucks <laughs> to come and tell us what you're doing in 2006. I'm like, okay. And, and, and they said, we'll pay your expenses. And you would have loved this. They're like, we're going to do golf and you're going to get a caddy. I'm like, now this is a hell of a yeah, time. Yeah. Like, Forget the 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is a thing. Yeah. And that was it. The rest was history. I fell in love with it and then was, you know, kind of growing the two businesses. So. I mean, you said that happened in 2006. Obviously, the crash happened. So if you're in financial world, what what was that like? So I was in financial for Northwestern Mutual. So okay. I was a financial advisor for a company that does so much risk management that a lot of those products are actually strong during really tough times. Mm. So I was able to still have great conversations and help people see the long-term perspective of your financial plan. One or two or three years is not going to impact a lifetime of savings over 30 years in your no. retirement. And some of the safer investments are stronger investments that have those great foundations with little risk. I still attacked every single day. And then all of a sudden I actually thrived. My breakthrough in the industry, when I got into the top 1%, got recognized within the company and the top, I think it was top 300 out of 10,000 advisors was that year, hmm. it was 2008. So I always believe that you can outwork tough times. Yeah. And it's the tough times that create your greatest strength. Mm. And a lot of people, they succumb to their feelings. I always talk about standard over feelings. Don't allow your feelings to dictate how you show up. We get so caught up in our feelings. The times are tough. So I'm going to not work. 
but people don't recognize it's the flip, which I know you recognize, is that when times are really tough, you're going to distance yourself from the competition because most people don't want to work. Yeah. So if you work, you build a strong business while everybody else is quiet or leaves their industry. Yeah. You know what I've realized about tough times is obviously no one's happy about tough times, right? Like it's a struggle no matter whether you're a business owner, whether you're an employee, whether you're a client or a customer, everybody's going through a tough time. You know, 2008, I was only, um, I was in college my freshman year. So I watched my parents kind of just lose it all, you know, house got foreclosed on all this stuff. They lost their businesses and that kind of scarred me into being like very frugal and like, yo, nothing is guaranteed. You got to really just be careful. And you know, fast forward, like, man, almost 15 years now, which is crazy. Um, you know, we got to see a little mini recession that was, you know, it not like that, but it was the worst thing since that, you know, the last call it 18 months. Right. And what's interesting is as somebody who's had businesses who some have succeeded, some have not, um, watching how emotional people get is interesting in a tough time because they think very irrationally and not objectively. And I think for me, I've been able to be very objective with like, okay, well, let's like look at the facts of what happened. Okay. This is what happened. You know, this is uh, what we did, what we said. This is where we're at today. What happened in between? And then you start looking at the facts and you're like, it's actually not that bad. And you know, your emotions are making it seem way worse than it actually is or telling yourself a lie because <laughs> the facts are the facts. So there's a psychology principle. It's called expectancy theory. Okay. It's actually a very simple principle that which you focus on expands. So when people are in tough times, they focus on the negative. The negative begets negative, And that's what expands. Yeah. Whereas when you focus on positive, you get more positive. So if you think about it just from this standpoint, Exactly what you just described is somebody who expectancy theory, all they're focusing is on the negative. I can't get out of the negative. Well, what do you think you're going to get when you pick up the phone? <laughs> your, your mindset is so unclear. How are you even going to say what you want to say? Yeah. Because of the negativity that you're living in, as opposed to you identify or break down. Hey, when did I have success last reverse engineer it? What were the disciplines? And my results may change but I can at least control a pipeline with daily discipline and action. Yeah. And even though the pipeline may be less than it once was, if I attack with that yep. discipline, I'll still get deals. And I wanted to bring that up too, was the problem people have during a tough time is they keep thinking about the past of how easy it was and what they were making and what they were doing, right? Or if they had this investment, right? And they didn't sell it back then and now it's worth this. And then they're like, you know, blaming everything they want to blame but themselves and the reality is you can't change what situation you're in right now at the moment you can only choose how to respond to it and you know so many people get caught up in just like living in the past like well dude this is what i was doing and this is what i was now i got to do twice as much work to make this and it's like yeah <laughs> that's the situation what do you what do you do and in that <laughs> period of time the people who hold on actually create additional market share so that when the times actually go up, you've probably built a team, sustained a team. And that's when you actually have the ability to attack and you have your best years because mm -hmm. most people leave. Look at what's going on in mortgage and real estate. I think it's down to like 75% of the people have left that industry oh, over yeah. the last 24 months. I coach four, well, now it's five of arguably the top 100 mortgage professionals in the world. Yep. They're incredible. And I joke with them all the time. I'm like, a couple of years ago, you probably had eight cell phones and everybody's texting Everybody all these numbers. Wants to, yeah. Refi <laughs> Come on, man. They're throwing you're money at you. You're closing deals over text messages <laughs> on eight different phones. Yeah. I said, now you're still attacking with your phone. You've maintained your team. Your deals are less, but you're poised to come out of this. This will be whether it flips in the second quarter, third quarter, or fourth quarter this year. This is probably going to be the best period of time you've ever had because more people have left. Yep. And you have individuals who know you're still in the business and you're going to probably have 20 cell phones the next time <laughs> and probably have the best year you've ever had. Yeah, because if you can withstand the storm, yeah, you got to work four times as hard and make less money during the storm. But now you've developed this new capacity that you didn't have before and this new perseverance and tenacity to <laughs> when, when times get good and you got the wind behind you. Oh, bro, it's a wrap. Simply put, I would share maintain discipline.
Hmm. If you always maintain discipline with your health, you're going to be in great shape. How do you stay? How do you develop discipline? So discipline is developed from taking action based upon what you really want and not allowing those feelings to dictate how you show up one day at a time. So feelings get in the way of action. hundred percent. I mean, that's why coach Saban kept me at Alabama. My yeah. first interview ever, I'm sitting in Coach Saban's office, which I know you got some Alabama blood in you, yep, which yep. Uh, we my, can talk about. My grandfather a played for Alabama. <laughs> right? Yep. We can talk about that. And so I'm sitting in Saban's office, face-to-face. You're like with the goat. Yep. And all of a sudden, he's saying, what are we going to talk about? Because whenever he brings in a speaker, you always have to sit with him. He's basically approving the message before he even puts you on that stage. Yeah. And I said, well, Coach, I said, based upon what you've built here, Based upon the expectations at Bama, I said, I want to share a message I've been sharing with other teams, standard over feelings. Mm. Don't allow your feelings to dictate how you show up. It's about living to that standard. Mm. That was the only time I ever sat in his office in order to get approved for a message. After that day and the response that the players had, I was there five years, two national championships, which is unheard of at Alabama. There's people who go there, they speak one time, and they get thrown out halfway into the speech. But because I understood... What he had already been delivering, but I was saying it a different way. He knew that I would be able to have success within that program. And I've been able to build amazing relationships, but it was that standard over feelings, which that's the goat. And I'm talking about, that's just not just football. Forbes magazine several years ago named him the number 11 leader in the world. So you're <laughs> talking, you're talking about leadership just at its leader highest period. level where you would go, if you were to come to practice with me, on Saturday, you could put up 55 points, beat a team, you're number one in the country, and on Monday, he'll break down that team and he'll ask powerful questions like, Ryan, at what point in time are you going to start doing the little things on a daily basis so you can figure out how great you can be? Hmm. And you're walking out of there going, like, did we lose on Saturday? <laughs> like, am I actually a bad football player? So he never lets you get comfortable. Yeah. And you get comfortable when you live to your feelings. And that's when you lose your discipline. When you stay uncomfortable yeah. and you stay locked into your standards. I'm preaching to the choir here. I know how you've grown your businesses. Yeah, yeah. And when you maintain those standards, that's when you drive your highest level of success. And then it's an everyday opportunity to live to those standards. You become weak in your standards, you lose discipline. Have you thought about writing a book, but just don't have the time? We would love to help you make that dream come true this year. Introducing BNC Publishing. We offer an in-house three-step process to help you bring your book to life. The whole process only takes 60 to 90 days. Compared to 18 months for traditional publishing methods, we work fast. To see if we are a good fit to work together on your project, email our team at info at bennewman.net. That's info at bennewman.net. Now, back to the show. It's interesting, man, because I... I played a clip at the last wealth con um i had seen it on instagram and it was from an old speech he did and you probably seen it too or and it was basically that like high performers don't like mediocre people and mediocre people don't like high performers yeah because it's just the standards don't align and it's like and saban was talking about it he's like my whole job right now is to get the right people on the bus and get the wrong people off the bus that's all i care about and he will get the wrong people off the bus fast And they're on scholarship. They're recruited. This is when I walked into the Malmore football complex for the first time for that interview in 2017. Ryan, you walk through the doors of that facility in Tuscaloosa and you just feel you can feel the thickness of the expectation and the standard. Those kids won't make it. Like, if you don't realize, like, you better come in there and be ready to attack it. You will be so uncomfortable. They won't. They'll put themselves in the transfer portal. Yeah. Not before playing time is even an issue because some people just can't take it. But those who can, there's players who never played in the NFL that are wildly successful in business because of what they learned in that Alabama football program. That's what makes it special. Yeah. The way just you talking about him made me think like, man, dude, if I was in college, well, now you can't because he's retired. But (laughs) dude, just like if you had the opportunity to play for a guy like that, take out the, you know, positions and, you know, playing time and, oh, well, this school is going to do whatever. Right. Like just to be able to learn as a man and and what it's like to develop those kind of characteristics and qualities. It's priceless, dude. Tell you one of my favorite stories. I don't know if I've ever shared this on a podcast and you being a former athlete. I yeah. Just, I feel the need to share this with you. Exactly what you just said. So I show up. It's that 2017. It's first visit, three day visit. And they had a practice and I go out to this practice and there were these exercise bikes that were lined up four exercise bikes. 
facing the practice field. I'm thinking, well, this is, you know, the guy's just going to warm up here and practice gets going, get going. All of a sudden, four guys come out and they get on these exercise bikes, all injured. Yeah. One guy's arm is messed up. Guy's got a boot on. <laughs> okay. He's literally got his leg out like this with the boot. He can only pedal with one leg. And it's one of the, you know, the assault bikes. Assault bikes. And he's got the arms going like this and he's pedaling with one leg. He's got, I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I said to one of the coaches, I said, this is wise. I've never, never seen anything like this. I said, why are they doing this? And they were also stopwatch saying, Hey, we're in the fourth quarter, final two minutes. So then they're pedaling harder and harder. They're getting them to push. So then I said, why are they doing this? I said, Saban has those bi bikes pointed at the field because he wants those injured players to watch the other player take their job. Oh, I love that. So you like that's <laughs> that's the level of detail. Yeah. So are you really hurt? Because like you probably want to get off that bike as soon as you want to, because we got five four stars at your position alone. Yep. Well, first off, the bike is boring and it sucks. But second off, yeah, you're watching your job get taken right now. Right in front of you. Yeah. So you better get off that bike or you're going to make the most of your time on that bike. So mentally, those are the types of things that Saban would do. That's just different. Yeah. You you don't see that anywhere. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at. I was telling you before where I was much more hands off and we were successful, but I was like, you know what? For us to be the absolute best, I need to go back in and basically exert my will and new standards on the company. And look, most people ain't going to like it and they're going to leave and that's okay. But you're better and you know this for those people to leave yeah. than to stay and underperform. That's not good for you. That's not good for them. That's yeah. not good for the brand. That's not good for the amazing things you're doing in the educational space. That's not good for the next person who comes and buys a ticket to come to WealthCon. That's not good for any of that. Yeah. The wrong person cannot be, it's not good for anybody. Yeah. That person needs to go, but you doing that or you look at what Saban did and the way that he developed people, it's a blessing mm -hmm. to have somebody like that that cares that much. Yeah. To have a guy that said every football player, whether they have NFL talent or not, will be on pace to graduate in three years. Whoa. Well, why did he do that? Because players are eligible to go to the NFL draft in three years. Yeah, he's expecting to So he wants to those kids having an education. Yeah. When you go to the – most schools just say – Hey, you know, <laughs> come back another time and finish your education. He was like, no, we're all going to be done in three years. Yeah. And if you stay four years, you'll be working on your master's by then. Yeah. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. It's helping people attack their standards. You're only going to help people be better. Only and, who want to be better. And and if they don't, they probably shouldn't be there. Yeah. And I, I know I'm tough to deal with with people on our team as our team yeah. continues to grow. I'm sure people are like, my God, like, yeah. I wish Ben would leave me alone today. Yeah. But I'm not doing it to hurt you. I've never screamed or demeaned anybody. I'm doing it because I just want you to be your best. Yeah. What do you think about, okay, so you were at North Dakota State too, which they won many, many national championships consecutively in, um, uh, what is it, D2? or It's not D2. It's one double A. Yeah, one double yeah. A. And um, like I said, I spent a lot of time out there when I was playing. Uh, it's colder than hell up in Fargo. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was only there during the um, summer, so I was there, Hey, you were good. Yep, yep. But. <clears throat> I'm curious because obviously that is also a high performance team. Now, granted, they're not Alabama. Um, what what's like what were they doing with their roster and coaching? Because they're not getting the five star best of the best people yet. They're performing at a high level and being the best for where where they're at. Well, I first off, I, I do have to say this. I have gotten very lucky when it comes to my college football opportunities. Yeah. So Coach Kleiman, when he brought me in at North Dakota State and Coach Saban over the last 15 years, those are the two winningest coaches in all of college football in terms of wins. Yeah. And I've worked for both of them. I'm in my 10th year right now with Coach Kleiman. We're now at Kansas State. Yep. And those five years with Saban, it's like getting a doctorate in leadership. Yep. And there were a lot of similarities between those two programs. A right. dear, dear friend of mine who was the third player I ever worked with in the NFL, Craig Dahl, He's the one who referred me into North Dakota State. At the time, he was a special teams beast for the 49ers. Towards the end of his career, he had an amazing career. And he refers me into the program. They had just won a fourth straight national championship. So I'm showing up for that first talk. I'm like, what the hell are you bringing me you, here you, for? Like, you guys are good. Why am I here? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you all got to figure it out. Yeah. And Coach Kleiman said something to me in his office. He said, I'm always looking for ways to get better. You can never stop getting better. Right. 
So he had that same mindset with these players who were already winning national championships. So the guys he brought in, they were hungry, similar expectation and standards. So they were recruiting similar to Alabama. It was almost like the Alabama of one double A. Right. So you look at their depth chart. There's four. Everybody's going to take your job. That guy who's fourth on the depth chart, he's ready to start right now. He was, he's gonna, he was at Alabama. He's now. And so yeah. you've, you've got all these things where it's expectation, it's standard. So these kids just expected the best. Yeah. And then they competed and they attacked and they were hungry because those kids at North Dakota State, those are the ones who didn't get recruited the way that the bigger programs right. did. And there's plenty of NFL players that came out of North Dakota State, 100. really starting back with Craig Dahl. He was one of the first to really set that tone. And then all these guys started to follow yeah. because it's a guy like Craig Dahl who says, well, that's possible. I can make it to the NFL. Yeah. And then these kids say, I can make it. There's more quarterbacks in the NFL right now, I believe, on active rosters than any other school. Carson Wentz, Easton Stick, Trey Lance. Now, even though those aren't all starters at one point, those guys have all done big things. They've got the opportunity. Yeah. There's only about 96 quarterbacks yeah. in the NFL. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant thing. Yeah, they probably got yeah, they've, almost they've as many as Alabama. Set standards. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because to me as an athlete, right, I played in the minor leagues. I never got to the big leagues, but you know, the goal is always to keep getting better and, and moving on up. Right. And so it's like you said it, Saban and Alabama are the, the top, they're the standard of success in college football. And, um, you know, uh, the coach at North Dakota state, he's now at Kansas state and he's going to, um, keep pushing that program forward and he's going to keep ascending and doing his thing too. Um, and it's just interesting for me, like, what do you think about this? For me, I was under recruited as well. So I didn't get to go to UCLA or one of these big schools. I, I went to Cal State Northridge and I was successful and we played those teams and it was great. But, you know, the goal is to not stay in a small pond. The, the goal is to be with the best. That's me anyways. I want to like be with the best. And it's easy to kind of stay in your lane. Like the coach could have stayed at North Dakota state and probably just won a hundred championships and just kept it rolling. But now he's like at a D one school going, going hard and a big conference and everything else. How do you get people to stop playing small in a little pond that maybe they could go dominate and then push themselves to do something different? So you're referring to like, how did coach Kleiman go and do that at Kansas state or the actual in, player? I'm, I'm, I'm talking in general, like a business owner, oh. a player, Cause it's just, for me, it's a metaphor of like, he, dude, he, the dude dominated that level. He's like, I need a new challenge. So, and now at Kansas state, he's already done it because the players have taken ownership of the things from a culture and expectation. Yeah. I mean, we're one of 11 teams in power five football that have won eight games or more the last three years. Yep. This year we finished 18th in the country the year before 14th, the big 12 championship in 22. So he's been able to bring winning there. Yeah. He reminds because, me of what Deion Sanders is doing. A hundred percent. Going from Jackson. We play, State. hey, we played Deion. So we'll be, uh, I'm on the sideline every single Saturday for the games. And so I yeah. can't wait, wait to go to Colorado. I think it's October the 12th. Okay. We get to play against Prime in, uh, the Buffalo Stadium, which is a beautiful, I've never been there. It's a, the beaut, that beautiful setting. Um, but so back to the question, the, the players, wherever you are or somebody who's in a business, I always tell people embrace the chapter that you're in. Yeah. If I wouldn't have embraced the chapter I was in when I was a financial advisor, if I wouldn't have embraced the chapter I was in when I was brokering paper, yeah. would I be sitting here with you right now? Probably not. My story probably would have been different. So I think you have to embrace where you are, attack and learn as much as you can. I remember great lessons from when I was a paper broker. Yeah. I remember great lessons when I was a financial advisor. I remember great lessons. I'm still learning now. I still have two coaches and I'm reading books every single day trying to get better. I haven't yep. figured it out. And I have mentors, dear mentors in my life who are doing way more than I'm doing who make me feel like I haven't even started yet. <laughs> exactly. And so those are the blessings is to always, wherever you are, just attack that opportunity. And I think those are the unique individuals who, yeah, I'm in a one double A school, but I'm not going to complain. I'm going to maintain a standard so I can make the most of this. They make it to the NFL or that individual who may be there. At, at a sales career, but they're like, gosh, I wish I could work for the Panetta companies. That'd be amazing if yeah. I could get there. Well, you're never going to get there if you don't attack where you are right now. Right. So don't, because we live in a world where everybody tells you how great they want to be. You and I have a conversation with their action. We find out how bad they really want it. 
They don't want it bad. So now somebody comes to interview with you and they, well, things aren't going well. Why aren't they going? Well, they, they, they start complaining. You're like, he ain't coming here. You can't figure it out there. <laughs> you ain't going to figure it out here because yeah. the same lack of discipline or lack of standards you have over there, you're bringing those over here. Yeah. And if you're trying to elevate a standard, so I always tell people wherever you are, even if it's not that ideal chapter, attack the hell out of that opportunity where you are. Because without doing so, you're never going to be able to make it into your next real big opportunity. You mentioned it. And this is this was my mindset as an under-recruited guy. It's like, okay, you know what? Yeah, these guys overlooked me when I was in high school. We're, we're playing on the same field now. That They may be at a bigger name school, but I'm going to go bust them up. Like, we're playing against each other. And then guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my time here. I'm going to do my three years. And then I'll see them at the next level where it's fair play. There's no school stuff we're all just competing as pros and like that was always my mindset and the same thing is true now and whether it's real estate or social media or events or anything else like all right you know what whatever however many years ago you you didn't want me to speak at your event or have me over Mm -hmm. here or whatever it's all good i'll just do my own thing and i'll just bide my time and i'll go build my own thing and we'll check back in five years from now kept the receipts yeah i always keep receipts I don't ever talk about them, you know, <laughs> but they motivate. Okay. Yeah. So I share So our podcast is called the burn. Yeah. And I found in doing this for 18 years that everybody has a burn inside of them. Yeah. And why and purpose is not big enough. I'm not saying that why and purpose aren't significant. They're very important. But if you don't understand your burn, you will never understand your highest level mm. of success. What's a so, burn? So the burn is actually what ignites your why and purpose okay. and causes you to be disciplined on the days that you don't want to do it. And especially after you win. So I'll, I'll unpack this in a few different ways. My mother passes away 11 days before my eighth birthday, divorced when I was six months old. We had 24 hour nursing care in our house. My mother's last year living. She came to the dinner table with an IV stand every single night to ask me how my day was at school. Hmm. So you don't think I appreciate every single day? I'm a 45-year-old man. My mom died at 38. That means I've been given seven extra years that my mother never got. My son is going to get his driver's license in two weeks. My mother never got to watch me get a driver's license. So you better damn well believe I'm going to own every single opportunity every single day. You just saw my intensity rise up. That There's a burn inside of me to continue to write my mother's story. I will not waste a day. Yeah. That burn, when I wake up, on my phone, Ed Milet, dear, dear friend of mine, when he had me on his podcast, he made me tell this story, which nobody ever had. You can actually name your alarm clock on your phone. So my alarm clock is Janet Fishman Newman. So what do you think the odds are when that phone goes off very early in the morning and I read Janet Fishman Newman, I'm going to hit the snooze button, and go back into those warm sheets. It ain't happening. Right. Because that burn ignites the why and the purpose. I'll go attack for you keeping those receipts. When I heard you say, I kept all those receipts, right? I could see it in your eyes. When you think about those receipts, there's no wasting a day. There's no missing your opportunity. Now, you could tell me why and purpose is my family, my three beautiful children. I'll do anything for them. I want to coach, motivate, educate, help people take it to the next level in their lives, build the Pineda brand and legacy. But that's probably why and purpose. That burn is the people who told you that you couldn't. The people who slammed the door on your face and said, Ryan, you're not good enough, man. Go get a resume before you come here. And you're like, I understand what's inside of me. I should have been on that stage. And that motive, that's a burn. Yeah. Some people, their sacrifice that their parents, oh, my mom and dad had two jobs just to be able to put me through college. Well, you're not going to waste your parents' sacrifice. And when you think of that, that's a burn. Mm. Or right now, somebody's sacrificing for somebody who's in their home and you, you picture these little eyes that are watching you and you're the example in your home. Yeah. So you're going to come and not make the most of your days. Yeah. Well, then what are your kids going to understand about life? Yeah. And so that is the burn. And I found that that's the difference of the highest performers. And I've worked, it's been an amazing blessing, national champions, people like Saban, Hall of Famers, some of the top individuals in business and in sports, some of the influencers people watch online, I'm doing coaching work with them and helping them behind the scenes and people have no idea that I'm doing it. Yeah. They all have a burn. Yeah. And it's that burn that ignites everything else. No, I agree. I've never heard anyone say that. It's true. Like your why and your purpose. I talk about that a lot. And obviously when you understand what that is, it like will push you through different things. But I love what you said about, yeah, but what ignites you to even want to do those things, right? What ignites you to what happened in your life that whether it scarred you, whether it burned you, whether it um, pissed you off, whether it wrecked you and you had to overcome it, like some there's 
definitely events in your life that change the course of what you do. It gives you perspective. Yeah. Let me share. I'm going to let me, let me tie this back to what you said just a handful of minutes ago about that team or those players. This is fat. This would be fascinating. It's one of my favorite college football stories. Team or players who understand that burn, the people who wish they could have gone to that next level. They wish I was playing division one. Then you have the players, like I said, who accept where they are right now. So at North Dakota State, so imagine everybody understands a burn. Everybody's willing to say, I was under recruited. Here's my burn. I'm fine. And then you bring that burn together. You can do amazing things. So you reference those guys wanting to go compete against those higher level schools. North Dakota State had a run of beating six division one opponents. They would actually get paid to go and play at bigger schools. Yeah. So one of the years I was there, we go into Iowa Hawkeye Stadium. They were the number 10 team in the country. They were coming off of not losing at home in two years, a Rose Bowl appearance. We were 24 point underdogs <laughs> and we went in and we beat them on a last second field goal. And I knew now I've, I can't bet on college football. I don't bet on pro football because the, the teams I work with and the players I work with. So I never bet on them. But if I could have bet on that game that day, Ryan, when I saw those kids, because of what you talked about, that that fire, that we're going to go compete, we're going to go show them, I would have bet my house as a 24-point underdog we were going to beat Iowa that day. Mm. And I the never money line would have paid good. I, ne <laughs> <laughs> I never talk about winning and losing when it comes to players. It's just you attack the process. You break down the game. It's six seconds of play, the one play at a time. Whatever the result is, it is. When we see zeros, if you attack six seconds of play until we see zeros, the rest is going to take care of itself. Yeah. As long as you dominate your one-on-one -on -one with intentional focus. Those kids were so hungry, which is what you alluded to. Connected, All of them connected to their burn. I, you just know that people can compete and win in life. Yeah. How do you separate, you know, pursuing the process versus, you know, looking at results? Because I, for me anyways, I struggle with, like, for myself, I know, like, if I'm doing the right process, I'll be good. So I'm, I'm fine with however the results play out. Now, granted, I'm also watching the results, so I know how to adjust and pivot and everything else. But, you know... When it comes to others, whether it's employees or anything else, like, yeah, I can see them working hard and everything, but if the results aren't there, how long do you tolerate it as a business owner? Well, if somebody's underperforming, you got to have those tough conversations, kind of like we had talked about earlier, to determine if they're in an environment where they can actually attack and help you hit that big goal. And if there's not alignment, you have to coach them out. You know, there's times like in Alabama, if a player's not doing it, you're going to coach them into the transfer portal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you're almost say, hey, I just don't think things are working out. You're a great kid. Let's let's help you find a better place where you can thrive, right? You're going to coach them into the transfer portal. Right. So too many people hold on to the results that they can't control rather than focusing on the process that you alluded to, which you can, but you know exactly where you're going. Yeah. You could take every single one of your companies. I could say, Ryan, what's the vision? Well, we're going right here. Yeah. So you know where you're going. That's where most coaches miss or most leaders miss is when they hear the message. Of, like I like to say, attack the process. Trust the process is not enough. My, my latest book, The Standard, which came out last year, there's a whole chapter on how trust the process is not enough. You have to attack the process. Mm. If you only trust it, it's not enough. You got to attack it every single day. So in order for you to hit those big goals, we got to attack that process every single day. Otherwise, we're going to fall short. But you know exactly where you're going. Most coaches and leaders don't understand that. Mm. They, get, they, they don't understand the message. They say, oh, well, just you focus on the process. It's going to happen. Just well, you better know where the just, hell you're going. Just basically be sitting back. The process <laughs> will take care of it. No, you got to like. You got to know where you're going yeah. because otherwise you can't reverse engineer the result of where you want to go and figure out what you need to do today. Yeah. So you got to say, I'm going here. Okay. What are the habits and disciplines based upon past performance or what I know is going to work? And then I'm going to attack it one day. To, as If you lock in on the process one day at a time and we start stacking those days, the byproduct is winning at high level and we're going to get there, yeah. but you better know where there is. Yeah. That's the crazy thing that people don't realize. I mean, there are books on it, like Compound Effect and Atomic Habits and other things where it's like, well, yeah, you know, the daily habits and things that you do, they just, you don't see them while you're doing them. And then you look back a year from now or whatever, and you're like, holy crap, like, look at where we're at compared to where we were. And to me, that's the hard part. And that is like the quote unquote, trusting the process. I trust if I wake up every day at this time and do these things, 
before I ever step in the office, you know, my life is going to be significantly better. I'm, I I don't know what the result will yield from it. You know, I don't know what my body will look like. I don't know what my mindset's going to be, but I trust that the result will be very worthwhile in the end. And that's the hard part. And that's where most people succumb to their feelings and they don't do what they need to do. Rather than everybody could look right. Somebody could come to wealth. Oh my, I, I want to have a business. It's just like Ryan's one day. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're not going to have Ryan's business today. <laughs> no, that's the part. That's the hard part. <laughs> but they want it now. They think because they buy a ticket to WealthCon yeah. that all of a sudden, if I show up to the event, it's just going to happen. No. It's like, no, it's aggressive patience and long obedience in the same direction for a long period of time. Repeat that they, again. Repeat that again. It's aggressive patience and long obedience in the same direction over long periods of time over and over and over again. Discipline wins, but people do not want to be disciplined. Mm. The highest performers, and like I told you, I feel like I just keep getting lucky because you meet high performers who know no, no other high performers. They refer you to high performers. So I just keep getting lucky. Yeah. I almost feel like I'm the one who's learning. I'm the one who's getting coached because it reminds me I need to stay disciplined. Yeah. But most people, they lack the discipline. They don't, they don't want to be patient. Fine. Don't be patient. Be aggressively patient. Yeah. Go attack every day. But it's that long obedience, the willing to do it over and over and over and over again that most people, they can't handle that. They want no part of how uncomfortable that feels. I want to get what that line on a shirt. That sounds, that sounds that way well, hey. <laughs> discipline equals X, Y, Z, all this stuff. I, I do like what you said about um, aggressively patient. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a weird paradigm I've had because I'm like, I'm actually really patient. I tell people that and they're like, really? I'm like, I'm super patient because I just know how long it's going to take me to get to where I'm at. But at the same token, I need things done now in order to get there. Certain things. I don't need the end result now, but I need, you know, all these certain little things done way quicker than what you would think is normal or possible in order to get to the long term game. And that's every scenario for every individual. They have to understand the long term game, but then have that willingness. What does it take every day? And being able to attack it. One you know what time. I just had a, an epiphany on that I've never thought about was is you were looking at me like something. Yeah, hit you. I had an epiphany because you mentioned the three years at Alabama. And I remember like once you have a clock, you do things very differently. So I remember stepping on to the field as a freshman. I'm like, I got three years to get ready for this draft and go out and get drafted and be the best I can be. And so you have a clock. And by doing so, you're just like, I got to do literally everything humanly possible because I got one shot at this. If I don't make it happen my junior year, odds are it ain't going to happen the way I want it to happen. And so most people in life have no clock like that. They think that life is infinite and that if it doesn't work out this year, it'll maybe work out next year or five years. But at some point, it's going to pan out. No, it ain't. You need some kind of clock and sports and sports is the only thing I can think of that actually has a true clock of like, yo, your career is going to end, buddy there. You can't play forever. Golf is the only sport I know where you can play forever. So golf is tight, but <laughs> every other sport yeah. you, you, you better, your clock is, you know, if you're trying to get drafted out of high school or your clock is I'm trying to get drafted my junior year. Or your clock, you know, and then if, if you keep hitting that clock, then you have the next clock. Because even when I was in the minor leagues, I was like, I know once I start getting to a certain age, if I haven't made it by then, I'm not making it. You know, I'm not making it if I'm 25 years old and I'm not at this level yet. Like, it just isn't going to happen. There are outliers, but 99%, it's not going to happen. So I, I know you love education. I know you love people wanting to take action. And so I want to I want to put this together in a bow for everybody so that they can they yeah. can take it and learn. From yeah. How do you how do you create you, clocks? You just nailed something that is so, so important. People hear that. Right. And what would most people do? They'd hear that and go, oh, that's so true in sports. I remember when I played and you put 60 minutes on the clock and that's gone. So, yeah, I'm going to attack that. But in life, they don't do that. A dear friend of mine who I used to chase when we were financial advisors, like we would chase each other to be tops in the country to go compete for Northwestern Mutual. He's now our financial advisor. He's one of the top fastest growing boutique firms in the country. Mm -hmm. He operates his his year and he's done this for the last 
20 years in three month increments. He found that I have to build three months at a time. So he's got sprints and attack periods and he's got different things that he calls it. Everything is in these three, three month segments. When he attacks everything in three month segments, he's built an environment that when he does that four times within a year, he's going to have tremendous growth. But he was intentional in determining for the team and the goals and the standards and what we do every day. That's how he wants to attack. So he's built it. Yeah. And the growth he's had is unheard of as a financial advisor at our age. It's, yeah. uh, it's unheard of what he's done manages billions of dollars. It shouldn't be happening in a small boutique environment. It's like he's got a hundred advisors. Yeah. There's he's like six advisors. Yeah. So he breaks it down. That's his time clock. Yeah. And so you have to figure out for you, you have to design it. You got to test it. You got to implement it. Yeah. And I mean, like there is natural clocks in every industry, right? So cl clearly in business, we, we run business by quarters. If you haven't run your business by a quarter yet, then I don't know what you're doing. No. Um, but in sports, you have the season and the off season. You know, you got the preseason. So there's these natural clocks by which you know you better be ramped up and ready to roll by that clock. You know, I think pitchers and catchers just reported for spring training. <laughs> you knew you had to be there that day. You better start getting your body ready months ago That's exactly to prepare right. for it, right? And the problem, I think, for most employees and people in life is they have no clock. It's just always going like Groundhog's Day. You know, their their job is just monotonous and always going. They don't have 90 days. Now, the business owners probably do, but they themselves do not have that. So I've built a tool. So there's six mental training tools that I've developed in my coaching work over the years that are part of what's called the mental toughness playbook. And I'm fine. I'll give it away to your listeners for free. There's yeah. a link free playbook.net. Freeplaybook.net. So, Freeplaybook.net. So it's the That's six mental, domain. six, six <laughs> mental training tools. It's been downloaded, loaded or sold over a million times. Like wow. these are my mental training tools. This is what I use. Yeah. One of those tools is called your prize fighter day. Okay. It's how you actually build and choose the disciplines that you already know you need to win one day at a time, personally, professionally, and in your service to others. And I believe you have to attack all those areas yeah. in order to have fulfillment and truly drive peak performance. You can't just focus on business, let your health go to shit, look like you eat bags of donuts all the time <laughs> and think that you're actually performing at your highest level in business. No. I don't care how much money you're making. If you look like all you do is eat bags of donuts, you're not making as much money as you could in your business. You just tell yourself you are yeah. so you can make excuses. And so, by the way, you won't be able to enjoy your money. You will not hate able, how you look and you won't. And you won't be able to breathe with your kids in the backyard. Yeah. Yep. And so for me, it's one prize fighter day at a time. So some people do it quarterly. I do it every damn day. I was about to tell you that. So, you know, you said this guy runs it quarterly and I'm like, look, I make quarterly goals, but like they're not really that important to me. Like, I'm just more so concerned about maximizing every single day and optimizing it. So for so for him, I helped him break it down to the one day at a time. And what are the disciplines you have to do? And we ended up finding his breakthrough year was 2018. And we sat in his office after I did goal setting in South Greenville, South Carolina with their office. They bring me in every year to do all their planning. And we're sitting in his office. He said, how am I going to get to the next level for this breakthrough? I said, it's easy. I said, everything you're already doing. And he attacks personal, great family guy, everything. I said, I believe if every day you contact, I'm not saying close, sell, just contact, like make it part of your environment. My action step every day, two A++ opportunities every day you will get to bringing in that $40 million for you by yourself. Just that was his personal goal, yeah. bring in 40 million new assets. We got to the end of the year. The entire organization broke down one extra discipline. I call it the unrequired. If you, you have what's required of you and then the unrequired. Can't get to the unrequired until you've done what's required of you. So I help people. I trick them psychologically. If you commit to the unrequired, you can't do the unrequired until you've done what's required. So you actually become more disciplined in what you're supposed to do than you add the extra. So he became more disciplined in what was required. When I called him at the end of the year before I was coming back, he said, you won't believe this. Look at what we did as an organization. Mm. They blew out the door. They originally had a goal of 80 million. I got them to commit to 100 million. They ended up doing 140 million. He had a goal of 40 million. He ended up bringing in 61 million. Yeah. And he said, every day I did the 2A++, I didn't miss a single day. Yeah. And so that's the same. You and I have the same belief. It's got to be every single day. Once again, we've been saying it over and over. People don't want that level of uncomfort. Yeah. It's the only way I know how to operate. Well, it's the only way to be a high performer.
And um, guys, we'll link to the uh, what Ben just said down below that that free guidebook. But um, I want to tell you how I apply that to my own life since people are familiar with kind of my story and journey. So yes, I'll set my quarterly goals. I'll set my yearly goals for what we're trying to do. And then, you know, to your point, you got to break it down into the daily thing that you can just make it very simple for how this has to happen, right? And so if we're just talking the business perspective here, because life, like we said, is, is broken into many components. But if we're talking about the business component, it's like, all right, you got to understand your KPIs. Like I know that, hey, if we want to make um, $50,000 a day, okay, how many deals do we got to do, you know? What does that look like? How many customers do we got to sell? If, if that's on the education side, then how do we, you know, on the real estate side, what, what do we want to make there? Okay. And you start to break it down. And you're like, all right, well, uh, that means we need, I don't know, let's say 10 sales a day, right? Well, how many leads do you need to get one sale? Oh, you need 10 leads. You need 20 leads, wh whatever the number is, right? Okay. Well, clearly then if it's 20 leads and I need 10 sales, I need 200 leads. Okay. What's that going to cost? How many salespeople do I need? What's the organization need to look like? Okay, cool. So now I start building what I need infrastructure wise to hit that goal. And then I personally am responsible for maybe one metric of it, right? If I'm the lead generation guy, I know, hey, if I generate 200 leads a day, we should hit our goals. And that's what I need to be responsible to because I can't be responsible for the entire thing, right? Same thing is true with your health and your faith, and your family. It's like, all right, you know, if I want to have a great marriage with my wife, what does that look like? Like, what would make her believe we have a great marriage? Not what I believe, right? Well, for her, having a great marriage is we have dinner every night as a family. She could care less if I text her throughout the day. She does not care. If I don't see her in the morning, she does not care. And she cares if I'm home on time for dinner. She cares that I'm mm. home on the weekends with our kids and just hanging out. She cares that we have date night on Fridays. I got date night tonight, you know? Those are the things that, the metrics for being a good husband and being a good dad. And I agree with them. Like, I think that that is my responsibility to my family um, in those things. And so guess what? I just gotta do that every day. I gotta just make sure I get home for dinner and structure my day accordingly to do that. Because if I do it, then I'm being a good husband. I'm being a good dad. Same thing with faith. It's like, dude, I got to spend time with God. So what does that look like? Well, man, if I got to go spend all my time with my family at night, when do I make time for God? Well, I'll make time for him in the morning yeah. and I'll go read my Bible. I'll go pray. I'll go study scripture. I'll go memorize scripture. I'll go do all those things before anyone else wakes up so that, you know, I'm getting my time with God alone there. And then guess what? I still want to be fit. I want to hit bombs on the golf course. You know, I ain't going to do that by uh, just going to work. <laughs> I got to go work out. I got to go practice. And so, you know, for me, I've just developed this daily thing of, yo, I'm going to wake up at five. I'm going to spend my time with God. I'm going to go get my health right. I'm going to go practice golf. I'm going to then walk into the office, go crush it with whatever it is I got to do that day to go hit my goals in revenue, in following, in real estate. You know, I got different goals that I got to do. And I know just what I have to do in my eight hour, nine hour period I have at the office. And then from there, I know I got to go home and do everything. So it's like, to me, it's just a daily thing. It is a daily thing. But if you slack, you say, man, I don't feel like waking up at five today, dude. All right. Well, something loses. Because those are the people who live to their feelings. Yeah. Something loses. You wake up at seven. What, what, what gives now? Do you skip out on your time with God? Do you miss your workout? Do you, you know, uh, decide to stay later at work now and you miss out time with your, something gives when you don't stay disciplined. There's so, a cost. So let me talk direct to the people for a minute. Can I talk direct to the yeah, people? Talk to them. All right. Tell them. So let me, let me share something with you. And a lot of times I, I love asking questions in order to engage people to choose behavior, but you have got to check this out. Eight minutes ago, we were literally saying, look up at the vision. You got to understand exactly where you want to go. And then you pull it down. You reverse engineer it. What did Ryan just do for you? What did he just do? He literally said, in business, here's what we do. Here's exactly where we're going. I understand the KPIs. And he went through about three or four different things that he does until he finds out exactly what he needs to do. 
Then he said, I want to have a healthy marriage. I want to have a healthy marriage. He pulled it down. He said, I actually, if I had conversations with my wife to realize the text message, but I better be at that dinner table. I know exactly what I need to do physically to hit these bombs on the golf course. I want to hit bombs on the golf course. I want to be in good shape. I want to be present with my kids, run around, not be heavy breathing because I eat bags of donuts and I want to be able to enjoy my weekends with my kids. He pulled, what did he just tell you? It's a one day at a time opportunity. That's all I've ever known. It's one prize fighter day at a time. So that level of intentionality is all I need to know about Ryan Pineda. So I know if everything were to crumble tomorrow, Mm -hmm. Ryan Pineda will be successful in whatever he decides to do next. And that's the thing that people don't understand. So that burn or the receipts or people telling you that you couldn't, there's just a fire. Take it all away. Watch what I do. Mm -hmm. And so because you understand discipline, you understand aggressive patience, you understand standard over feelings, but you're also willing to stay uncomfortable through it. So I that was absolutely beautiful to hear you say that because that's how people win in life. Mm. Most people aren't willing to do that. No. And most people aren't aware <laughs> that that's what you need to do like they just and it's actually know. pretty simple you literally you gave one <laughs> example boom 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 boom. but they can't even get there yeah because they're so caught up in their feelings yeah well or and i'll say this it only works if you know what gives you the results you want right so if Correct. you don't know how to be a good husband well, then, yeah, it, it you don't know. It's hard. So you got to start testing and asking yourself questions, asking your spouse questions. Hey, what makes you feel the most loved? Like, what do you really enjoy that I do? And it may be awkward. It may be, you know, something you guys have never asked each other before. She may not, not even know the answer herself, right? And you're going to have to do some soul searching and some fact finding and everything else. You know, you think that I knew how to just go make $50,000 in a day? Like, no, it took many years of trial and error and testing and other things. And guess what? It's always changing too. It's a moving target. So it's like, yeah. So right, right now I'm just focused on getting our 200 leads. And then guess what? I'll get the 200 leads and then the cost per the leads go way higher or the conversions start to slip. And I'm like, all right, well, now what do I need to do today? You know, what, what's my daily KPI look like now if, if that's not it? All right, we need more sales team. All right, I need to talk to or, or put out these ads to get more salespeople or whatever the case is. Like I will change my intentionality for business all the time on what I need to be doing to help us hit the big goal because it's not always the same. So that's called breaking down the game film. Hmm. You understand that in sports, but in life you have to do the same thing, right? So you're not settling, you're not becoming complacent. And so you have a willingness to not be what I call seduced by success. Hmm. So really what you just described was the one thing that holds people back at their highest level. One of my favorite questions is how do you show up after you win? Mm. So what did Ryan just tell us? After you win, you say, I'm not going to be seduced by success. I'm going to figure out, okay, that's how we got to 50,000. If we ever want to get to a hundred thousand, we want to get to $200,000 in a day. I'm willing to break down that game film to say, where do I need to make the tweaks? Where do I need to make the changes? What do we need to do differently? You're not just going to accept Oh, 50,000 is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you were at once at zero, yeah. And now you're at 50. <laughs> yeah. I know you can get to 100. Exactly. 100%. It's just whether or not you're willing to get there by not being seduced by success and having that awareness and willing to go through those and, changes. And also being aware that, yeah, sure, we do want to get to 100 on average, but that's we're not there. We got to hit this milestone first. I get people who are like, bro, I want to be a millionaire. I'm like, you're broke. You, <laughs> you, you, million, don't worry about that right now. Let's figure out how to make 10 grand a month, you know? And then be successful today by doing the things that it's going to take to get to 10. Exactly. What I, what I, my first speech was 500 bucks. Yeah. I've been, now what I get paid, it's a hell of a lot more than $500. Yep. Yep. I mean, I've gotten paid a hundred times that to yep. give talks. Mm. And so you're talking about, that's a long time, 18 years to be able to do that and be able to get paid that, you know, I'm not one of those individuals. I'm, I'm, I'm here in Vegas with you for a spine convention, right? Yeah. I didn't pay to get on the stage for the spine convention. Yeah. I had to have to get paid $500 for my first talk. Yeah. And then I had to have talks where they gave me coffee cups back in the day. I was going to say, you did you many free up, talks. Yes. And, and you come home and your wife's like, Hey, how did it go? Like, like they gave me this coffee cup. They're like, yep. how the hell is that going to pay the bills in the future? Yeah. But I knew. If I was getting coffee cups or I was getting nothing, 
but I was doing it for the right reasons. The money was going to take care of itself. And it has, and it's been a blessing yep. because it's never been about the money. No. And I know, and I don't know how, you know, everything with Saban played out, but I can guarantee you they're like, Hey, Saban wants you to talk to Alabama. You ain't, it doesn't matter if he pays or not. You're going to be there. You'll be like, yeah, dude, I will talk to Alabama. You know, if, if, if Alabama called me right now, me, I will go do it. Right. I'll be like, yeah, let's go do it. That sounds tight. So it's actually interesting. I don't know if I've ever shared this on a podcast. So when they called, they said, what's your fee? What's this going to cost for you to come? And I didn't want to be the guy Mm -hmm. who showed up one time to put Alabama on his resume. Yeah. I wanted to be the guy because I knew I could be on Coach Saban's payroll. Yeah. And before I went in there, I knew and I believed I could be on his payroll because I could make a difference with those players. Mm-hmm. And so when they said, what's your fee? I said, I'm not going to charge you anything. Yep. I said, I want to make sure that I can move the needle and make a difference for your players. I will show up. I'll pay all my own expenses. Yep. And I will be there. Mm-hmm. And the willingness to make that sacrifice is what had me on Saban's payroll for five years. It was all the little. I wasn't going there for the money. The money was a byproduct once they knew I could do the job. Yep. And everybody wants the money. The number of people that I coach, we have a program called Coach to Coaches where I take people behind the scenes of what I've learned, the mistakes I've made, the things that have worked over the last 18 years. Like I said, some of the highest influencers on the planet, I coach them behind the scenes. People have no earthly idea that I do it. And I'll let people who call me and they're just like, oh, I should be getting paid $10,000 to speak. I'm like, well, what do you get paid now? Nothing. I'm like, well, how the hell do you think you should get ten thousand dollars? Like, the market doesn't. Where'd lie. that even come from? Like, the market is the market. The market's zero right now. So, to your point, like, go to a car. The last time you bought a car, like, go to the car dealership and actually share some of the principles you think are going to work with that car dealership sales team. And if it doesn't work, maybe you're not onto something. And if it does work, maybe that that's what allows you to then go to Ryan Pineda one day and say, "Man, I should I should be on the stage at WealthCon." Yeah, and I'll say, "You're right." Because here are all the sales teams that you worked with and you've helped people create wealth and you've helped people. Absolutely. I'd love to have you come and speak at WealthCon. Yeah. Yeah. People, they they want it right now, but they're not willing to do what it takes. Like you described. Here's Ryan knows exactly where he's going in every area of his life, but he knows what he has to do today. And you've got to be willing to put in the work. How do you figure out what you should be doing? Like, I guess, long term, right? you know, purpose and everything else. Like most people, like I said, it's hard to figure out what to do today if you don't even know what the heck you want. Well, I think you have to get clear on how, back to Alabama. In 2012, I started telling myself that I was going to be the performance coach for Alabama football every day. Why? It was just one of the beliefs. That was the standard. That was the highest possible level. I mean, like, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to be at that level. I wanted to be the very best. Okay. In 2014, I sent Coach Saban a street sign. So basically for two years, I just told myself that. So I literally had a street sign made based off of one of his quotes from a press conference that says, the best street sweeper in the world lives right here. I'll show you a picture when we're done. Yeah. And it says, the best street sweeper in the world lives right here. Called these friends of mine, the Duvers at Vinyl Images in St. Louis. I said, I need a big, orange, obnoxious street sign. Here's <laughs> what it needs to say. And he's like, who are you sending this to? I said, Coach Saban, he's like, dude, have you lost your mind? I said, well, well, he said in a press conference after they won a national championship in 13, reporter says, Coach Saban, when are you going to start playing it for next year? He said, tonight. And the reporter's like, tonight? What are you talking about, tonight? He said, you don't understand me. When I do something, I do it better than anybody else. If I were a street sweeper, there'd be a sign out in front of my house that says the best street sweeper in the world lives right here. Yeah. So I have the street sign made. I send it to him because everybody sends him a letter. You got to send him a box where he goes, what the hell's in that box? He hung that sign for three years in his office. Wow. Because you were intentional with and thoughtful. In 2014, I sent him the sign. When did I tell you guys, if you were listening earlier, I got hired in 2017. Yeah. Aggressive patience. I was willing to wait. Most people aren't willing to do that. But I knew in 2012, that's what I wanted. So what did I do between 2012 and 2017? I sat on the bench of my high school basketball team for no money. I was working for NFL players, right? Helping them. I was helping other college players. I was doing things, testing things. Are these principles actually going to work? Yeah. So when I sat in Coach Saban's office, there were all these years of discipline to the things I knew would work, which gave me the confidence when I sat in that chair to say, I'll come for free. I'm not even going to tell you what my rate is because I knew I was going to be on his payroll. Yeah. See, people don't have clarity of where they want to go. 
And so what you're alluding to is you got to get clear. You got to be courageous. People might, people would look and say, you're, you're going to work for Alabama. For, oh, okay. Good, good luck to you. You're a financial advisor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And they'd say, what do you, what do you, what, like, how do you even come up with something like that? It doesn't matter what people think. Yeah. You have to be willing to believe it, but then put the action behind it. Yeah. No, that it makes complete sense. It's funny. Cause, um, right. I mean, high performers set crazy goals and achievements, right? Like, or else they would just be normal people. <laughs> they were just normal goals. Right. So I think what you said, or Saban said, and like, I've thought about this too. He's like, dude, I would be the best street sweeper. If I was a street sweeper, I was like, that's how I felt about everything I do. Like I just so happened to be in baseball early on in my life. But then as I got into real estate, I'm like, dude, I could be the best at this. This ain't no thing. You know? Oh, podcasting. I could be the best at that. It's not a big deal. Oh, you know, throwing events. Yeah, we could, we could throw the best events. That's not going to be, I don't want to say it's not going to be hard, but I go into it, my mindset of like, why wouldn't I be the best? Like I, I've been the best many <clears throat> times at pretty much anything I've ever put my mind to. So why wouldn't I be the best? And at the same time though, I also have awareness of what I'm not the best at. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be the best tech guy. There's, there's no way I'm not going to be the best, uh, you know, detail oriented, you know, kind of guy. But things that I know and have confidence in, I'm like, yeah, I will be the best. And it may not be right away. It might be years down the road. I might have to build up my track record and my skills. I might have to go take a bunch of punches in the face along the way. Might have to fail a bunch, but I'll find my way to be in the best. And because because I don't know, for me, I look at the competition of who the best is. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, this is some normal dude. He is nothing special. You know, this is not like. Sports is the only thing I think is unfair about being the best because you can't like LeBron is LeBron. There's nothing you can do about it. He's yeah. six, eight. He's a freak. You, you're not going to beat him. He just is what he is. Right. But then I look in the business world and I'm like, yeah, these guys are just normal dudes. They're, they're no different than anyone else. They just are more disciplined. They got bigger vision. They got bigger balls. They got bigger everything that makes them get to where they're at. They're not afraid. How good is your tech team? My tech team's great. That's the key. Yeah. See, if you really, because I, I love paying attention to the details of what somebody says. So you unpacked everything in terms of your belief. Yeah. But you said, tech's not for you. Tech isn't my thing. But your tech team's great because you knew you had to leverage for you to have this setup, to have this beautiful building, to have all these amazing things that you've done in the studio and all your tech team has to be great. Yeah. Your sales team has I've to be great. I've never edited a video. So you, <laughs> I wouldn't even know what the hell to do to edit a video. I yeah. mean, we've had the same creative director for seven years, Tyler, and Tyler's amazing. I could yeah. literally give him a voiceover, these videos that I do for football teams that have never gone public. Alabama, every week, got a, foot, a video for me, a hype video. Nobody's ever seen the videos. They've never gone public. Yeah. He did all those things. I wouldn't know what the hell to do. I just knew, like, I know the words to say. Yeah, and yeah, And I'm yeah. going to dictate it. I know what I need to tell him. send it to him. So you have to leverage to the people that can help you establish a vision. Most people, they become so cluttered or they're like, well, I'm going to do it by myself or I'm going to save money doing this. I'm going to, if you're sitting here going, I, I'm going to become great in tech, then you're not going to be able to have the clarity to do the things that you need to do. Well, I so think that's why I had to ask you that question. Yeah, yeah. I think people <clears throat> just don't, it goes back to standards, man. Like we've been talking about because bro, if I'm going to do anything, I want to win. There's just no other way around it. You know, I remember I was in a mastermind and you got to give a presentation, you know, usually like once a year. And then they vote for the best presentation. You're going against like 20 other beasts, right? And I'm like, well, if I'm going to go spend all this time making a presentation, I better freaking win, you know, because there are people who give presentations just because it's the obligation to be a part of the group of giving the presentation. And I'm like, these guys are losers, like, and they're successful people, right? But in my mind, I'm like, what a loser for just, I don't know, like not taking it serious and trying to be the best. Like, are you here to just consume and whatever else? Are you actually here to compete and, and be the best? And so I did three presentations. I won all three and I love it. I just don't want to lose. Like if I'm going to put, I'm either going to go out all out and win or not play. There's no in between. So where does that burn come for you? I was kind of alluding to what I thought it was or the keeping of the receipts. So for you to have that mindset, to have that level of confidence, no matter what it is, I'm going to attack it and I'm going to win. Where does that really come from for you? 
That's a good question. It's funny. I gave my first ever presentation last WealthCon where I cried and I never have cried on stage before. Um, and I got emotional just talking about my dad and not for the reasons that most people would, because most people have daddy issues and you know, their dad trying to prove their dad wrong. Their dad never told them they loved them and all this stuff. And my dad was the exact opposite. My dad was there for me, told me he loved me, took me to every game, watched every game I ever played, got me coaches, literally did everything possible to help me become the best version of me. And also told me, like, help me believe what I believe today. Mm. Of like, Ryan, why can't you be the why can't you be the best player in your team? You can. I'm like, you know what? Like from a young age, like, yeah, I could, huh? And then you do it at a young age and it's like becomes this self-fulfilling thing where you do it so many times throughout your life that it just becomes the expectation now. So whether it was school, you know, I graduated college early too. Uh, whether it was, you know, sports, I'm just like, look, if I'm in it, I got to be the best. There's no other way around this. And so I don't know. I just like develop. I, I don't know that it came from a burn more so than maybe just like the fulfillment of just everyone knowing you're the best. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's more vanity, but I don't, I don't know that I had like a scar that forced me into mm. now granted in sports, you do get, you know, burns of like, why is this guy ranked higher than me? Why is this team, you know, ranked higher than us? Or yeah, we took a tough defeat, right? We lost in the playoffs and like now I'm pissed and we're about to go get them next year. So those things definitely happen too. So this is, this is actually, I think, a, a unique thing. I think a lot of times people hear my story, which is pain. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that burn coming from a place of love, mm. which is probably what made you cry. Yeah. And so that's a powerful thing that the burn was actually, the belief was so strong that you're almost saying, how am I going to waste this opportunity when you have somebody who looks you in the eyes? I'm the opposite, brother. Mm. I had the dad who, all the reasons why my mom divorced him. And Other most things, people have your story. And when my mom died and he moved back into the house, there's no divorcing your dad. Yeah, you're stuck so with I, I had to take what I got. Yep. And so mine comes from a double-edged sword. There's nothing wrong with your burn being, man, I was fueled with so much belief. You're damn right. I'm going to go get after it today. And that's kind of how I feel just with like faith and everything too, where it's like, if God has put me in this position and given me so many talents and gifts, what a waste if I just freaking blow them and don't take them serious and slack, what a waste. And to me, that's disobedience. Like you talked about having obedience over long periods of time. It's exactly how I see it. It's like, if God gave you all this gifts and he talks about stewardship and everything else, and I'm going to go over here and waste my talents, <laughs> that's disobedience. There's no other way around it. So when you mentioned earlier, once again, I pay attention to the details. I hope everybody pays attention yeah. to the details. You have to put your head in the word every morning. Yeah. Right. So part of it, whether you realized it or not, that's probably part of your burn. Like that's that connection to your burn. Cause you know, like God has given me this and maybe there's some belief things that you do that you connect to. So you've probably, even though you'd never heard it called the burn, cause that's yeah, very, yeah, yeah. very unique for my coaching style. Yeah. You already innately knew that. So you're already connecting to your burn. You're connecting to the, like for me, if I don't read my daily devotional, so whether yeah. it's a hard one or Jesus calling, which I do on the app, which I did it this morning at the hotel, yeah. if I wouldn't have done that this morning, if I wouldn't have gotten my workout in this morning, if I wouldn't have literally written out my burn statement this morning yeah. and literally put surrender in a box, which means I'm surrendering to the, to God and all the pain and challenge. And I'm just going to get, I would not be able to be locked in with you right now. Yeah. I, I, li I would be off. I'd yes. go, Oh my gosh, I got to get my workout in. I got, I, I did it because I have to do those things. Amen. And so for you, I just, I, I love that, that now we're coming. I, 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 maybe I need to steal this for a burn episode to say, cut this piece for me. Cut it, cut it but, for him. <laughs> take it, take, take all the content you want. But it's beautiful because I think people, they see what you've done and they don't realize the level of intentionality. They probably, oh, he just, one of, well, you know what I hate when people say grind? Oh, I grind. I'm like, oh my God. Like, that drives me crazy. 
Like Ryan Pineda hasn't gotten to where he is because he grinds. Now, if you like saying, no, you're very clear. You're intentional. You, you know hard. what you need to do. Yeah. You work hard. You're aware. I don't feel like I'm grinding doing things I don't want to do. No, That's but what you're, you're aware. You know what you need to do. Like, I think people think because they see, oh, I'm going to grind like it. No, like go figure out. And I, what is, what is the exact thing you need to do? Ryan literally said, I wake up at 5 a.m. I've got to put my head in the word. I have to do these things. I've got to work out. I got to move my body. I got my, you know, exactly what you need to do. Everybody listening right now, they actually know exactly what they need to do. Just like you need to do exactly what you need to do. Yeah. The reason why you've built what you built is because you do it every day. Yeah. The reason why somebody's struggling and I I've encourage been doing people it for 10 years, for 10 years, I always say to people, fine, if you're not getting the results that you want, that's okay. But don't trip on anything that's behind you. Change it today. Yeah. Don't, don't let us have a conversation three months from now, right. or you listen to a guest on your show three months from now who happens to be talking about similar things. And you're like, Oh shoot. I remember that episode three months ago with that guy <laughs> who talked about discipline. Yeah. I still lack discipline. That guy was too intense for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I always say I never yell at anybody. That vein starts popping. It's just my passion, <laughs> but it's one of those things like just change today. Then yeah. don't worry about what you haven't done. If Ryan's been doing it for 10 years, then make your day one your path to his 10 years. Mm. But you got to be willing to do day one and day two and day three and yeah, day four. Yeah, because I committed 10 years ago not knowing where it would lead, right? Just like, hey, I, I, I feel like this is what I need to do, you know? And I think so many people, I don't know, they just think things are optional. That's the problem. People think that, oh, man, well, you know, I don't need to do the workout today. It's all good. And like having that kind of mindset where you start thinking things are flexible or optional is when you lose because you don't realize how many things that trickles into, right? So if I have the mindset of, no, none of this is optional, it just is, it is, it happens. Um, you know, I tell that to the guys in our Bible study. We've been holding Bible study in the office for almost eight years and, you know, it's every Wednesday, you know, the time has changed over the years, but right now it's at 730. And I go, guys, I've literally not missed one Bible study in eight years where I've been in town. Not one. And you guys think it's optional. You don't have one hour to spend, yet you go spend an hour dicking around doing whatever. And I'm like, that's the problem. That's why you guys are where you're, where you're at. It's why your relationships suck. It's why your business sucks. Because it's, it's not even about faith at that point. It's about how you treat things in your life. If you treat them as optional, everything is optional. The workout's optional. The Bible study's optional. It's optional whether you come home on time or not. It's optional whether you see your kids. It's optional whether you make the offer. It's optional whether you make the content. That becomes your whole mindset of everything is optional. None is necessary. Mm. It's not optional. Nothing is optional. Not if you want to have great results. If you want to have regret in life, Make it optional. Yeah. I mean, who wants to go 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, and all of a sudden you're going to look back and say, oh, I wish I would have paid attention to the details of how Ryan shows up and things that he shared, and I went to WealthCon, I did these things, I was part of his education, but I never took action. By the way, guys, if you want to see Ben at WealthCon, comment below. <laughs> dude, I, you're getting me fired up. I'm like, this dude needs to lead the next WealthCon. And just like the moment the first speaker just set the standard of, Leave right now if you're not ready to roll, baby. Like, that's what I'd be like. I'd be like, leave right now if you don't want to be held accountable and if you don't want to develop discipline the next two days. But if you do, then you're in the right spot. It, it, it'd be an honor, brother. It'd be an honor. Yeah. Well, bro, I've had a lot of fun um, talking today, man. I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I'm about to go hit the golf course and like, Go let my burn out and go crank some balls. Go kick Kevin Nas' ass. Yeah. 350 yard bombs and say, I don't care. Like, just yeah, go I don't take care them that you're on tour. I'm going to hit it farther than you. <laughs> that will happen. But, um, no, but it, yeah, it's, it, it's funny. Every time I have conversations with guys who are of the same mindset, it, it definitely fulfills me because mm -hmm. it's a rare set of people. And, um, so I'm, I'm grateful to, to know you now and everything else. And, um, you know, we're going to link to everything you got going on down below. If you guys ever want to get coached by Ben, I mean, dude, I'm freaking like already fired up after <laughs> just an hour or so. That's a two way street, brother. Thank yeah. you. Yep. So we'll link to everything down below. And uh, where's the best place for people to connect with you with? Uh, ben Newman dot net is the website. I mean, down at the bottom is all the different things that we do. And then at continued fights, my Instagram at continued fights. Yep. What yeah, is continued fight. So I've always believed that life 
is like, you know, people used to say, you know, life is like a sprint. No, it's a sprint. It's a boxing match. It's a marathon all in one. And my mom was the greatest prize fighter I've ever known, a champion of life. And somebody had at Ben Newman. So I said, let's roll with that continued fight. There we go. Everything's a fight, baby. (laughs) 